In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Leaf Tulin and I, we are going to discuss the top NBA prospects in the West region for the 2024 NCAA tournament. Who better to talk about college basketball than Leaf Tulin, the guy that watches more college basketball than anyone else. So stay tuned to find out his top NBA prospects in the West. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And my co-host for today is none other than Leaf Tulane, the college basketball expert. We're going to have some fun with this. It is NCAA tournament time. The games are this week. So the next few weeks are going to be all about the NCAA tournament and the prospects that we will be seeing in the NBA next year in the NBA draft. But before I get too deep into this episode, I want to let you know that it is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to, but faster. So post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply if you're not subscribed to the channel please subscribe like share comment click the bell so you can be notified every time we drop an episode because we are your source for nba draft content if you missed the last episode we talked about you know the ncaa tournament we talked about some of the players who Teams were on the bubble that didn't make it. We talked about some potential matchups. But this episode, we're just strictly talking about the top prospects in the West. Leaf NCAA tournament starts this week, your favorite time of the year. Just just a random question here. What is your most memorable NCAA tournament memory? And I'll give you mine first. 1997. I'm giving my age here. You weren't even born here, probably. No. Nope. I was three, three years a, before me. Senior in high school, and I predicted Arizona to win the national championship. That is like the highlight of my NCAA. And I haven't got a bracket right since. I haven't won any money since I've lost for like, I don't even know how many years it's been. I guess it's almost 30 years now of losing. But that year, I got it right and actually met Mike Bibby a a few years back. And I talked to him every once in a while, and I I let him know like, hey, man, that – year i predicted arizona the win and he was telling me the story how they were barely supposed to make the tournament that year and they just got hot at the end but that is like the most memorable moment for me other than i remember the fab five but i was i was younger i was probably like in middle school so those are my best ncaa tournament memories but what about yours that made you like fall in love with basketball well falling in love with basketball happened when i was about four um so one that popped up when I was four was the 05 tournament where oh gosh, I watched you were four and 05. Yeah. I turned five just a <laughs> bit after that. But uh, that if we're starting from the origin, North Carolina and Illinois, I was, I was sad because Darren Williams, who actually went to my jazz um, lost. And I thought that Illinois team was awesome, but that was, I, I wasn't old enough to really understand basketball, but that was a really fun mm-hmm. one. Um, that I remember the, where I was when I watched that game, I was in Atlanta and I watched the game at Puffy's, who's well, not a name to talk about right now, P. Diddy's restaurant, Justin's. And I watched that game there. And I just remember like being in there and like Terrell Owens was in there. So I, I that's like my specific memory of that particular Final Four. I, I was in my basement watching at my old house with my, <laughs> my dad. And I remember being like, man, th- this guy, these, these guards are really good. Like I remember thinking that, but, but McCants and Sean May bullied their way into it. But no, to, to more, more realistically, uh, in when I was in eighth grade, everyone put pitched in big money, which was sh- surprising for us back then. And, uh, we all brought in printed brackets, like my whole friend group, plus some other people and e- everyone put in their bracket and I won it. And I was devastated day one because Dayton beat Ohio State and I had Aaron Kraft and Ohio State doing well. And I was like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. I ended up winning it. It was I was awesome. And I won it by the skin of my teeth because no one had UConn winning in 2014. But because I had one team going further in Florida, 
Um, and my other friends had Florida winning it all. I ended up winning. And then the next one is I went the first year I went to March Madness. I went to San Diego with one of my best friends and we saw Eddie Lampkin and TCU push Arizona to the absolute brink. And we saw the the game winning dunk or so we thought, but it was, it was after the buzzer by Dalen Terry and there was a foul and, and all this stuff that was so dramatic in an overtime game between Arizona and TCU. And that's my favorite in-person game I've probably ever attended other than maybe some jazz games as a little kid where there was some epics. I remember that game. That was, it was late here, but it just seemed like it went on forever and ever. All right. Let's talk about the West. Who are your top, or we could say, who is your number one NBA prospect that is playing in the West? I'm torn between two teammates. I've made a list of eight or nine guys that I think will be drafted from this region. Uh, my top one would be either Jacoby Walter or Eves Missy. Um, I, I don't. I, I think it's difficult to determine which one goes higher, just because I think they're two guys that could improve their stocks if they play well here. Obviously, Walter came in with more acclaim, more one and done uh, talk surrounding him, but I actually haven't been terribly impressed by him. Mm-hmm. But he's one of those guys on a three seed. If he shoots it well, he can really improve his stock playing in big games and big moments. And Missy, I think, stock is climbing. He's getting better and better. He protects the rim. He's been part of what has revitalized Baylor's season. Not that they were struggling tremendously, but he's he's helped them protect the rim, and they're not very good defensively. Um, so he's helped them protect the rim. He's showing more skill and footwork and coordination offensively. Um, so those are my top two prospects from this, this region. And Baylor's got a decent draw. I think New Mexico is dangerous, but obviously Clemson's the sixth seed there. Um I don't believe that highly in Baylor's ability, but if they make a decent run, those two guys could really help their stock. Yeah, I want to talk about Walter. Me and my brother had this conversation earlier today, and uh, he's not as high on him. And he's looking at his shooting splits, which are not good in conference play. But what makes me, and I've, I've dropped him a little bit, what makes me a little hesitant about him, and you can probably relate to this a little bit, and maybe it's just because they went to the same school, but I look at Keontae last year. Keontae's numbers were similar. They did play the same position, but they were similar. You know, the efficiency wasn't there, but the flashes of the eye test were there, and that's how I feel about Walter. You don't see too many guys – that can shoot on the move like him, or at least comfortable with it. Now, I don't know. I know that's part of his game, obviously, but I don't know if the role that he's playing at Baylor right now is the best role for him, or is it going to be the same role he plays in the NBA? You look at Keontae, he was playing, what was he playing, a three last year? (laughs) At 225 pounds, and he's playing at 180 right now. Yeah, so I'm a totally different player. But, I mean, if you just look at Keontae's last five games – other than Wimbayama and Chet, I mean, there hasn't been a better rookie in, in the NBA in the second. I mean, Brandon Miller's had some games, but t- to me, Keontae is going to be first team all rookie. His last five games have been crazy. And so maybe it's because they went to the same school. Maybe they shouldn't even be compared, but I'm a little hesitant to give up my Jacoby Walter stock because of his inefficiency. Uh, quick aside for you. I was talking to a former NBA assistant coach, former front office guy that I talk with regularly. And I said, how many rookies would you take over Keontae George? And we excluded Chet for context purposes. We were just talking about the 2023 draft. So obviously Chet was 2022 and he, he was thinking hard and, and, and he's been in the NBA for a long, long time. And he goes, Wembenyama pauses, says Miller. And he goes, even that, not not obvious. And then Keontae George. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and it's, it's it's that's that. But the thing is, Keontae George was playing out of position, played overweight. And honestly, I watched him in person at the tournament last year, and he hurt his stock, and then he helped his stock in person when I saw him at the Combine in his pro day, and he was running point guard drills, looking athletic and shot better than anyone else in their pro day at DePaul's arena. Uh, to answer your question, though, about Walter, I, I think – what concerns me is not a shot. I think his shooting splits are fine. I think he's one of the best shooters in this class. I'm concerned by his lack of wiggle. Like he doesn't, he doesn't do anything to create space with the ball in his hands. So is he just a guy who comes off pin downs and shoots and has mediocre size in the NBA? Uh, I, I, I think he could shoot 42 percent from three, and I'd have the same concern as him shooting what he does right now. But what's weird about that is for a guy that doesn't create off the bounce, he gets to the foul line. 
that's one of the weirdest things. Like most guys that aren't creative just don't get to the foul line. Most guys that don't attack the rim don't get it to the line. And he gets to the foul line at a significant rate. I I know he does, and I've watched plenty of Baylor play, but it doesn't it doesn't move me. I came into the year high on Jacoby Walter. Like we mm-hmm. talked about him after his game against Auburn. It, uh, sorry, yeah. not against not against Auburn. Again. Oh no, it was against. It Auburn. was Auburn. Yeah. We recorded like right after it, or maybe yeah, it was and, during and scored, the game. And he scored twenty eight. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, if you if you listen back to that, everyone, uh, especially the every every dares who listen to it. I'm pretty sure I mentioned one guy that intrigued me was Eve Missy, and I tweeted mm-hmm. it out that game, uh, where where I said, "Well, this guy's what won them the game, but obviously the appeal is going to be about uh, Jacoby Walter. Walter can shoot the cover off a of basketball. Like that game sold me entirely on that. But but the athleticism's concerned me because even that game he was coming off pin downs and just shot well, and he made free throws at the end of the game when they were fouling because Auburn was behind. Yeah, I mean that that game he got off to a blazing. A blazing hot start. Um, I actually had Missy. I want to say I had him at 15 on Big Board 1.0. But as far as Walter, I mean, these numbers, 34% from three on six attempts per game, which is respectable. I mean, six of pretty much his 11 shot attempts per game are threes, but he's only shooting 37% from the floor. But he gets to the line five times per game, and he shoots 80% from the foul line. And he's a solid rebounder. 14 points, those numbers are good. The 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 passing, I think he's a better passer than he's shown, and that's just based off of the film that I saw from him when he was in high school. But I'm, I'm hesitant to sell my stock based off his inefficiency, but he just hasn't wowed me since the Auburn game. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with him in this NCAA tournament. All right, when we return, we're going to get a few more of Leaf's thoughts on some of the top prospects in the West. Stay tuned. But before we get into that, let's talk about LinkedIn. Why? Because LinkedIn is, one, our sponsor for today. But if you are a small business and you are hiring You're looking to find quality professionals that fit the right role. Just like when you're the GM of an NBA team or a college coach, it's all about fit and finding the right fit. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs because LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And LinkedIn is just not your average job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. And hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates in your pool. Matter of fact, 80% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and they may not have the time or the resources to hire. And that is why LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. As you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming channel, which is called Locked On Sports Today. And if you're a baseball fan, mark your calendar for March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern for the best Major League Baseball season preview, which is coming exclusively to Locked On Sports Today. So check it out. March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Be the first to get local insights from Major League Baseball local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Find it on March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern on Locked On Sports Today streaming channel, which is on YouTube, and it is free on the Amazon Fire TV channels app. All right, second segment, we just talked about Jacoby Walter. We talked about Svi Missy. Who else are you looking forward to watching in the West that is a potential first round prospect or even draftable. Well, I think there's a couple guys that stick out to me. 
Uh, the next one on my board in terms of this year would be Pella Larson from Arizona. And he's someone I've kind of had a love hate relationship with in terms of coming into this year. I mentioned him as a guy who would have a breakout season. And in a way he has, he's performed admirably shot the ball. Well, he's in my opinion, the most valuable player on the best team in the pac 12. Uh, he, but the issue is defensively, I think he's got to make strides. He's not very good in pick and roll and shooting. How real is, are his shooting splits? That That's where the question begins. He's also 23 years old, so that does him no favors, but he's shooting 43% from three. Is that real? Then maybe he moves up. But I think in a, in a way, he could really improve his stock by Arizona making the Elite Eight, the Final Four, which I think they have a really good path to do so. And then you look you look at him and you see – okay, those numbers are good. He plays a role that he could play conceivably in the NBA. And then I made this comparison uh, at the beginning of the year. I think I was talking about guys I was higher on coming into the season. I said, oh, he reminds me a little bit of Christian Brown. And I know that's an easy comparison to make now where you see him taking a bigger role in a good team. And I know that they're the same uh, race, the same ethnicity. But I I, I think that's athletic. Yeah, he's not as athletic as Brown, but he's a better shooter than Brown. Yeah. And and he, they play a role that's complementary on top teams. You typically see guys that could go in the first round and that have those athletic traits. Because because Larson is a good athlete. He's not Christian Brown athletic, but he is a good athlete. Yeah. You typically see those older players getting the ball in their hands. I actually like that the fact that they're playing off the ball and, and learning how to play complementary basketball. Yeah, I think the role that he plays to Arizona is like preparing him for – the role that he would play in the NBA. My only knock on him is that, dude, you're shooting 43% from three. And I know your team is really good and you're not getting a lot of shot attempts. But, man, I just want to see an increased volume on his threes. He's taking less than three attempts per game at 43%. And I just want to see more. That's kind of nitpicking there. But I do see him as someone that I think could stick in the NBA as a connector, or I see him landing on one of these teams that has like a super high payroll and they're looking for some wing depth to fill out, you know, the the back end of their rotation and he can knock down open shots and complement whatever max players are on that team. That's the role that I think would be would be best fit for him. Where do you have him ahead of Deron Holmes as far as like your personal unofficial big board? They're about in the same category where they, they range from 25 to 35, 25 to 40 for me. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm overly infatuated with Holmes, uh, despite a lot of production, but it's hard to ignore the production on a team that got in that large bid, which is, we saw today, was difficult to get. Yeah, I, I like Holmes. I'm high on Holmes. He is a lock first-round pick on, on my big board. I think the the shooting has developed over the years. I think there's some passing chops that that there's some potential there as a passer. I like the athleticism. He's blocking shots. I think that he's going to be fine as an NBA player. I actually heard that there is a, a team that likes him, and they'd even take him in the top 20 if, if he's available. But of course, it's early, you know, and I actually heard this in, in February, so things could change. But uh, I actually like him a lot. I, I I'd have him ahead of Larson on like my personal mock. I think most would, and and my reason for not liking Holmes is mostly in person. Last year at the combine, I felt like he was aloof. Like he was in sick. The, okay, and, and I didn't yeah. know that, so that that yeah. may that may contribute. I felt like he did not look athletic. I felt like he wasn't the athlete that someone of the build he sh- he has should be. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that is a fair point. I've watched him play this year, but I can't unsee what I saw in person. However, I will be at the games that Dayron Holmes is playing in Salt Lake City. Okay. So I will I will have an updated outlook on terms of his athleticism and and that type of stuff. But that's my big knock is I felt like he moved differently in a way that I didn't um that I didn't in like I didn't think that is how an NBA center moves, and yeah. I don't want him playing the four. I guess is kind of where I was torn. Like he's slender of build, but he wasn't moving quickly enough for me to to be infatuated by taking him in the first round last year. This year it's a worse draft, but still I had that reservation, knowing he was sick. Maybe that pay, that factors. I factor that into my evaluation of Gigi Jackson, who who was not good in his pro day nor his practice that we saw in person. 
And then I still had him in my top 16. I, at one point I had him in my top 10 and I almost regret moving him down, but that's, that's my reason for being a little lower on Holmes. Uh, yeah. That said, he's been productive. Yeah. From what I was told that, you know, he's already naturally slender and last year they were trying to bulk him up. He thought like getting stronger, which obviously he needed to get stronger, but it just wasn't the right kind of weight. And so one of the reasons why he looks good this year is because he's kind of figured out a nice, comfortable weight for him. I mean, we we saw with like Keontae. It's it's like, you know, you, you have these guys and you tell them they need to get stronger and bulk up, but sometimes they're not putting on the right weight. Keontae put on too much weight last year, and now he's found a comfortable weight for him. And like you said, there's a – you know, former NBA coach that's like he may take him number two in in, in a redraft. And so I think with Holmes, he found the right weight. But there was a bug going around last year at the combine. Like we saw Gigi was sick. I know um Holmes. There's a few other guys that that were sick. And from what I was told, I know Brandon Miller wasn't there. He had mono. Um, well, he was there, but he was coming from Mono. But from what I heard was that, I mean, you were there in Chicago, that there were some guys that were doing all their training in warm weather places, and they got to Chicago and maybe not familiar with Chicago in May and how the temperature <laughs> close to downtown and by the water is like 10 degrees less than than what it says on your phone. And some guys got sick because they just weren't prepared as far as like what to wear. Not saying that was the case with Holmes, but I know for a fact that he was one of the guys that was under the weather at, at the combine last year. But I like him, man. I, I liked him then. I would have taken him at least in the early 30s in last year's draft. And I think, you know, he you could say he made the right choice. At least, at least in my opinion, he made the right choice coming back to school because now – I have him as a as a first round lock. All right, when we return, I, I want to ask you about one of my favorite players, Tyen Grant Foster. He is a player that I'm really high on. I actually have him as a first rounder, and I'll explain why. Stay tuned. Let's talk about our new sponsor, Stitch Fix. You know that instant confidence boost you get from an outfit that makes you look really good? And like Deion Sanders says, when you look good, you play good, feel good, I'm paraphrasing here, but that's what you get when you try Stitch Fix, because with Stitch Fix, you get a stylist who understands your style, your size, and your budget, and they do all the shopping for you. It is the easiest way to update your wardrobe this season. A stylist will help you find new on-trend favorites that work for you and just for you. All you have to do is give your stylist your size, your style, and your budget preferences, and you get boxes whenever you want without a subscription required. And they send five just for you pieces plus outfit recommendations and pro styling advice. You keep what works and you can send back the rest. Your stylist will always send you the right pieces and the fit will be on point. It's like they have style ESP. I don't know how they do it. They just do it. Stitch Fix makes it so easy. If you don't like to shop, you can save time and effort, plus get the outfits that make you look good and feel good. And if you don't love something, you just send it right back. Shipping returns and exchanges are always free. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That is stitchfix.com slash locked on. Again, stitchfix.com slash locked on. All right, last segment, I kind of teased it a little bit. And, I mean, there's a few more prospects that I'm sure Leaf has in mind. But I want to talk about Ty and Grant Foster. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about just his phenomenal story. Didn't play basketball for 16 months. Almost died from what I was told. Had multiple heart surgeries. Goes to Grand Canyon. Leads them to the NCAA tournament. I think they already had a school record for wins he is a phenomenal athlete big time scorer but is a very very underrated defender and one of the reasons why I have him as a first round pick based off of his production and his athleticism and tools and I know there are some red flags because of the the medical history and then the age he has two things really working against him 
But the reason why I feel like it shouldn't work too much against him is because if you're going to use his age against him by being 23, then you can say the same for Dalton Connect. Now, he wasn't as productive as Dalton Connect in, in, in the SEC, but we're talking about a guy that hadn't played in 16 months. So he's missing or he's missed a lot of time in basketball over the last couple of years. So I still think there's room for growth. And if you're concerned about the heart issue, then if you're going to hold it against him, then you can't hold it against Bronny. And I know Bronny has some other factors that are <laughs> working in his favor, but I do think that if we're just being fair, based off of, at least in my opinion, athleticism, positional size, and ability to defend multiple positions and rebounding and scoring, I, I think Grant Foster is one of the best prospects in this draft that not a lot of people are talking about. Well, yeah, he, he was actually two away for my list. I had, I had one other sleeper guy uh, that I wanted to bring up that I don't know if he'll come this year, or the next year, but for Ty and Grant Foster, my thoughts on him are really how well can he shoot the ball on a off ball? Like when he's playing yeah. away from the basketball, because with, with Grand Canyon, he's not necessarily always on the ball, but he gets the ball asked to attack and go downhill like his last game he shot 18 free throws that, that's awesome and i'm i'm all for it but how does that translate to the nba where his athleticism which is very good um and he goes from playing in the whack to playing against guys who are similar athletes how does that translate and how does it translate if he's a 33 percent shooter like he is in college like that's that's still a leap of faith to believe he'll be a 33 percent shooter in the nba if he's that again college I, and i know his usage rate will go down so that could mean a better shooter but some players aren't like that sometimes they need the ball for rhythm so my questions around him aren't about age they aren't about athleticism they're mostly about shooting and how he adapts to a role that's very different from the one he has um, on a mid-major team that has made the tournament and looks pretty good. Yeah, he's a, a guy that when I look at his 33% three-point shooting percentage, I think that he's a decent spot-up shooter. I think his percentage is a reflection of his shot selection also. Yep. He's he's a, a heat check guy. He's a very confident scorer, and sometimes – the threes that he, that he has taken are not like the most high percentage threes, if, if that makes sense. I like him. I actually talked to a, a scout about him today when I was at the Mavericks game, and he was like, I like him, but my concern mostly is guys that don't put up a lot of assists. He was just wondering, not necessarily the shooting in a scaled-down role, but he just felt like he doesn't pass the ball enough. And I jokingly said, well, you know, the guy didn't play basketball for 16 months, so maybe he feels like he needs to make up for lost time and get his shots up. But I'm really, really high on him. Let's talk about another player that that you are high on in as far as like your, 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 your personal big boy that's coming out the West. I don't think anyone else in this in this region I have overly high – I would I would include Toppin, uh, JT Toppin from New Mexico is someone we talked about in the previous episode, which I think he's a good athlete. He's he's someone that would need to fit on a team as a rim protector energy guy. I have one for next year that I'm really, really fascinated by, uh, and that's Jaron Stevenson from mm -hmm. Alabama. I think he's he's a guy who's going to break out. Right now, he's a little too thin and too raw to play a big in the SEC, and, and Alabama is susceptible on the front line already. So the way they play is very analytically derived, three points or layups, and then defensively they give up a lot of rim attacks, and he's just too thin. He gets he gets beaten down there. But he's six foot 11, 210 pounds, freshman, who's got the ball handling capacity and I think a shooting stroke that will translate. Right now, he only shoots 29%, but you don't see too many 6'11 freshmen on teams that had top 15 written all over them all year shoot the ball as often as he was giving license to shoot. Out of his three point, uh, out of his field goal attempts, almost 70% of his attempts were threes, and you see him on a team that has a lot of veterans who like the ball in their hands. Mark Sears, Aaron Estrada, guys that have had the ball in their hands for five years of college basketball. Yeah. Yet he was giving license to, to have the ball in his hands, do something. I think he's a breakout guy for next year. And then Ryland Griffin's a guy for this year that I, I wonder if he tests the waters because he shot well. He shot 38% from three, has good length, and has functional athleticism, even though he's slender of frame as well.
Yep. So Ryland is a guy that I've watched for years. He was Casey Wallace's teammate in high school. There was actually a team, I want to say one year with Ryland, Keontae George, and Jordan Walsh. We're all on Drive Nation's AAU team. And then as far as Stevenson, just pure coincidence, last year when Gigi Jackson was here in Dallas doing his pre-draft, Jaron came down for a week, and I had a chance to watch them work out together and play one-on-one. Actually, I filmed it. I have the footage, and maybe I'll share it with you. But he's someone that I'm high on. But the thing that you, you didn't mention about him was he reclassed up. He's yep. still supposed to be in, in high school. And so there were a lot of people quietly were, were thinking that he was going to have a Noah Clowney type rise where he, I mean, if you look at it, his field goal percentage, or at least three point percentage, was pretty close to what Clowney's was. And Clowney's, Clowney was a first round pick last year, if I'm not mistaken. I think Stevenson's a far better shooter than Clowney. Clowney was physically stronger yep. and, and a better defender. I think Stevenson's more skilled with the ball. Yep. And, I I also I, I did fail to mention he was a, a young uh, he was young for this class, but I think part of the reason he appears younger is just because of the age of their backcourt. So they don't pass him the ball as often in terms of in positions to succeed with the ball in his hands because he has to defer. I, I think that he could play on a lot of teams right now, and the age wouldn't matter because he's super skilled. It's just when you play on a team where your rhythm is impacted and you're asked to just shoot threes and it's make or miss, it, it's hard. I think he could be a top 15 pick in a loaded draft next year. I think so, too. I I definitely think so. And like I said, I I can show you this footage to where, I mean, Gigi's playing really, really well. I'm not surprised, and I know you aren't surprised, because I feel like we were like the the two guys that (laughs) defended Gigi (laughs) all last draft cycle. But Stevenson, and I mean, like, they were going at it one-on-one, and you just saw, like, this is the modern-day prospect i mean you got these two bigs that are handling the ball and creating space and i feel like stevenson hasn't had a, an opportunity to really really showcase everything that he could do this year but next year next year could, could be the year let's talk about grant nelson real fast <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts on grant nelson I, i've talked to people that still like him they still think like what he can bring to the table is what some teams don't have which is athleticism in the front court and then there's some people that I've spoken with are just like, he should have went to the ACC. I actually had someone tell me if he went, if he went to the ACC instead of the SEC, they thought he'd be better. But they just thought the SEC was just a little bit too physical for him, and he kind of struggled with that. What are your thoughts on, on Grant Nelson? I, I've never been terribly high on Grant Nelson. I know last year there was that video, and they're like, oh, my gosh, they're a top 20 guy that no one knows about, and everyone then reevaluated and put him in either too high or too low just to be kind of contrarian. Uh, I, I, I'd i seen him play at North Dakota State before that video surfaced, and I was like, oh, he's skilled, but like he didn't think much of it. And then uh, we saw him at the Combine, and I don't think he was very good. I've seen him play probably 15 times at Alabama this year. And only two of the games, I feel like he's been impactful. And he's the largest yeah. reason this defense is bad. Because <laughs> he, he he's asked to be, and it's not necessarily his fault, but schematically he's asked to be a rim protector. And he's too thin. He gets banged off the spot and teams get to the rim. And then the team collapses and they give up a billion threes. What do you think he's missing? Like, you just look at his talent. He can handle the ball. He's athletic. He has some tools that that you like. But it just seems like... There's some intangibles or there's something that he's missing. I think he's an overrated shooter um, to the point where I never thought he was a good shooter. <laughs> well, yeah, no, nor did I. I, I, yeah. uh, I, I think everyone else was like, wow, well, he handles the ball. He's skilled. Therefore, he must be a good shooter because mm-hmm. he's slender of frame like that. That must be what it is. Uh, I don't think he's a good shooter. I think he's a good free throw shooter, which means something, I guess. Yeah. But but uh, no, he he's. He's a tweener. He he would have to be a knockdown shooter at the four to make it work, and he's not a five at the college level or the NBA level. So I think he got this unfair acclaim that's held him to this high standard, and I think it's interesting to say, oh, he'd be good in the ACC. The ACC's got some more back-to-the-basket bigs, whereas the SEC's just got these pure physically imposing athletes Mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily super strong, but they just go to the rack so much higher and harder than some of these other conferences. So 
I'd be curious because I think if he were to be in the ACC, he'd have to shoot well against some of the bigger bodies. He'd have to defend. He'd have to uh, compromise their ability to defend him by spacing the floor, which is the same question that's asked of Filipowski. Like, how well does Flip shoot? Well, Filipowski does well against bad teams that give him 20 feet of space, but against teams that athletically can match him, he seems to struggle. Hey, we're, we're, we're on the same page with that. You mentioned with, with Holmes how there was something like you just can't unsee him at, at the combine. Grant Nelson against Arizona is just something I can't unsee. He took 19 shots, but 15 were threes. Like, I still just don't understand why would you take 15 three-pointers in a college game if you are not, like, an elite elite sniper like has Reed Shepard even taken 15 threes in a game why are you shooting 15 threes in a game when I mean I guess his freshman year on a very low volume of attempts he shot 35 percent from three but he's been low 30s and he's actually been in the 20s his last two years and so when he took that many threes I just like this guy is is bailing the defense out when he's attempting threes instead of like attacking the rim but overall, he had a pretty decent year, 12 points per game. I would like to see him rebound a little bit more. But he's had some games. I think there was one game. I can't remember exactly who it was where he made, like, some crucial rebounds where he showed, like, some grit and some toughness, which has kind of been one of my knocks against him. But I think he has some tools. I would totally use a two-way on him if I were NBA team and just see if we have something there. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, Toolsy players are the guys that I would extend two ways for, but I wouldn't extend a draft pick. Like I, I mentioned how I couldn't see the thing about Dayron Holmes, but productivity is productivity. Like, I, I mean, Dayton's a seven seed. I, I think that's probably overseeded personally, but, but like that's, that means he was doing it on a tournament team. And obviously Nelson is too, but he wasn't the best player on his team. I don't think he's the second best player on his team. Yeah. He was viewed as the best prospect coming into this year, largely erroneously but but yeah, many because because of that video i actually told uh the guy that did the video i maybe it's his brother i was like grant nelson should give 50 percent of his nil money to to kj for for posting that video because that played a huge role in him getting to alabama and, and the buzz around his name All right, i want to talk about a few more prospects as we wrap up and i had this question presented to me by someone on arizona staff and they were like why isn't Caleb Love getting more NBA buzz from, you know, people that cover the draft? I share my opinion, but but what is yours? Uh, just because there's not that many spaces in the NBA for inefficient chucker style scores. And defensively, he's improved but he's not big enough to warrant like, Oh, we can mold him to be a defensive guy. Who's a knockdown shooter. I think he could be a knockdown shooter, but you can't take away the, the mentality, the way he tries to play basketball and, and say, Oh, well, if he's good at defense, like then it's worthwhile when he's not like that good at defense. I think he's average at the NCAA level and that's not good enough to be a pick. I actually really like KJ Lewis. Um, one of his teammates at Arizona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, my my answer was, I just think he's already put in the box. We saw the three years at North Carolina where he was just extremely inefficient, where he shot below 40% for like three straight years. And people are always going to see him as like this uber confident, like you said, chucker, but just a, a bad shot taker, a guy that maybe at best could get like a microwave scoring role. I just think he's in this weird position to where he may not get drafted. He may end up on a two way and he may leave the G league in scoring. And that's going to like work against them because that role that he would have in the G league would not be the role that a team NBA team would ask him to play. And he just has to like figure out what would his role be in the NBA, which means he'd have to, change his game in a sense so i think he's just in this really really weird like predicament because you know he can score he may not be the most efficient but does going to the g league unless like he literally goes there and says all right i'm going to show teams that i can run an offense and make the right play and, and pass 
But then you're like, like I said, you're asking him to like totally change who he is. So I, like I said, I think he's in this, in this really weird predicament. And then I want to talk about Harrison Ingram and RJ Davis. Yeah, I agree with everything you said about Caleb Love there. I, I think we're of the same mind. And Harrison Ingram is someone I've seen tons of as I watched him every game at Stanford. <laughs> and I was skeptical of his ability to shoot. I, I believed in his ability to be an adequate defender despite not being a very good athlete. And when I say very good, it's to the NBA standard. I think he's mm -hmm. above average uh, collegiately. Uh, you had mentioned that he he was put on this like one and done trajectory late, like by a lot of people. And it ne wasn't necessarily his plan or his pace. And I think that's good insight. Harrison Ingram shot the ball. Well, he's adapted to being this junkyard dog role, as opposed to the lead facilitator and mm -hmm. lead score that the role that was asked of him at Stanford. And uh, I, I actually would take him in the second round. I, I think if he shoots well, which is a bit, still an if to me because I, I've watched him shoot a lot of times, and I think he's a better shooter now, but I still don't know how good of a shooter. His rebounding knack is impressive defensively, and the fact that he's bought into being a junkyard dog, even though he was a five-star, is something that I value. Yeah, the shooting is, I think that's going to be the, the, the swing skill for him. Like He had two years at Stanford where he was at 31% from three, Jumps up to 37% from three this year on, on like a career high in volume of attempts. But then the free throw percentage is like low 60s. It was like high 50s last year. So you're wondering, it's like the shooting legit. I do think that he helped himself because kind of like Jalen Tyson, in a sense, two Dallas guys that, you know, I saw in high school, but they transferred and played two totally different roles at two different schools. And I think if your NBA team, if you combine what they did at their different roles, that you get like the full summary of who they are. So like with, with, with Jalen Tyson, you never saw like the initiator and the ball handling stuff at Texas Tech, but you saw him as a spot up shooter and you saw he could shoot with Harrison, you saw him in this like lead role at Stanford, but then you saw him in a complimentary role. You saw him play well in that role. So I do think that in, in both guys' situations, NBA scouts have a lot of film on them playing two totally different roles that could actually help them out. Yeah, I think it it really has helped me appreciate the way he can play as not the top guy where you get, Oh, he's, he's tough because he backs people down and uses his size, which is what would he'd be like, Oh, he's rugged. Well, now you're seeing like the actual rugged in terms of the gritty tenacious competitor that sometimes gets attributed to people who are like playing like their hairs on fire. Well, he he's shown he can do both. And, and one role is more desirable for the NBA. And that's the one he's played at Carolina. And I, I think props to him for finding the right school to bring that out of him. Yep. And, and also props to him and Hubert Davis for getting him to embrace that role and excelling at it because I think North Carolina has got a chance to cut down the nets because of Harrison Ingram. Harrison Ingram's the guy that controls how far Carolina can go for me. Yep. I actually had a scout last year on um you know, we just we were talking about Harrison and what should his next move be as far as does he stay at Stanford? And and possibly play for a new coach because you know Hassel's rumored to be in, in the hot seat last year, or does he go to a new school? I'm like, well, either way, he probably could be playing for a new coach. <laughs> either way, so you might as well go somewhere else. And um, and the scout was asked, or the scout mentioned, he says, I think Ingram is a good player. He said he's not good enough to where he can make a bad team good but he's good enough to where he can make a good team great. And I think that's exactly what he's done this year. Real quick, RJ Davis, you know, a lot of people are, you know, you get the people that say, man, why is he on draft boards? And, you know, you look at like what he has done on co in college and his resume, in, in your opinion, where do you see him at next year? I don't think you can pick him uh, even with that great of a year, just because he's diminutive in stature uh, and he's a two guard. He's not a point guard. Uh, there's no coincidence that he, the, it's funny because he played point guard when they made the final four. And it was, it was like, well, of course they're doing better because they have a point guard with the ball and not Caleb love. And that was like that. That was the big deal. That was what everyone said. 
But it, the same things happen where he's been far better because Elliot Cadeau handles the actual ball handling responsibilities and defending the point of attack against the quickest defender. So he's he's not he, he'll try hard. He will compete defensively. Don't get me wrong, but he's just not big enough to be seen and, and impact an NBA offensive player. That's a one or a two. And so if he's a two guard and at that stature, you really got to be like Trey Young good. Obviously, he's a point guard. You got to be that good with the ball in your hands to find a way onto the NBA court. So I, I think the best case scenario for him is bottom of the bench type of guy in the NBA and likely a G League guy. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tuling. We just covered some of the top NBA prospects in the West. Stay tuned. We're going to cover each region from the east to the midwest to the south this week once again it's rafael with leaf tuline and we are out of here 